worship you, Jesus. You are sovereign, oh God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We entertain your presence right now, Jesus. Come your way. Come your way.
Why don't we intensify that hand clap of praise to God tonight. Give Him a little bit of glory. Somebody shout the name of Jesus. Lift up that name above every other name tonight. Jesus! There's nobody like you, God. Jesus! If you believe there's power in that name, say, Jesus! Let that power flood the house tonight. Jesus! Hallelujah! Find somebody tonight, shake their hand, look them in the eyes and say, there's power in that name. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> that didn't work at all. Praise the Lord, everybody. There you go. It's working a little bit now. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. I don't know if everyone has picked up on this today, but if you were here this morning, if you're here right now, you should feel something happening in the Spirit. God is setting the stage for this church. Something's coming up. And if your heart is ready for that, would you just give Him one more hand clap of praise and mean it from the bottom of your heart. God, whatever you want to do, this church is ready for it wholeheartedly. We had one of our precious children, Leighton Crow, baptized this morning. Know that Tyler Gilmore is getting baptized tonight. They said Wednesday night after he received the Holy Ghost, he couldn't start speaking in English. It took him a little while. It took him a little while to let the landing gear come out and circle around and make his landing finally. But God, we thank you for every single one of these things that are happening with our children with our youth with our adults every member of this church we're nearing up on something wonderful you may be seated we're about to take the offering uh, just a few announcements to go over I want to remind you if you're part of the Easter greeting team if you're interested in being part of this we need all hands on deck because we're gonna have people coming in and we want to set the stage from the moment they walk in the door somebody with a smile on their face and the Spirit of God inside their heart setting the stage for a wonderful Easter Sunday. If you're part of that team, we have rescheduled the meeting from, for the 18th of this month, April the 18th, Thursday, at 7 o'clock in the music room. So 7 o'clock Thursday, April the 18th. I remind you again that we do have April the 20th. Our Easter egg hunt is on this grounds at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's Saturday. We'd like everybody to be there, invited guests. Not just a Sunday morning service, but also to that Saturday uh, afternoon egg hunt. It's going to be an incredible day. And Pastor Dean has wanted us to let you know that the Dominion shirts, these men's ministry Dominion shirts, are actually on sale in advance.
for the members of POBC. You can get your hands on one at the information centers. $15 for the short sleeve, $20 for the long sleeve. You're paying five extra dollars for just a little bit more holiness. Putting a premium on it. Put Pastor Dean down for one $20 long sleeve Dominion shirt. Sold. Ushers, if you come up here, I'm about to say something dumb. I can just feel it. <laughs> you better come quicker than that. <laughs> this morning, Dr. James Hughes, I took three pages of notes. And all the information that came in was amazing. But don't get lost and don't be fooled. There was some incredible information that was delivered, but there was also an incredible anointing that was delivered this morning. And there was a call to intercessory prayer for the Pentecostals of Bossier. You could already feel it happening in the prayer room this evening. So would you do something with me? Would you just lift your hands as high as you can get them and start declaring the works of God as we pray over this offering? Father, we thank you for every blessing, and we want to bless your kingdom back right now. God, be with us with your anointing, with your power, with your presence. Do something special in this place tonight. We receive every bit of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, would everybody in the house say, in Jesus' name.
We worship you today, Jesus. There is none like you. I give you glory and honor today. I magnify the name above every name. I give you glory and honor. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. What an incredible presence of the Lord that's here tonight. God's desire is that you have the greatest life you could have. Jesus declared to his disciples, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God does not struggle trying to bless you. Your failures, your past, your mistakes never cause him any kind of a problem when he decides to bless you. You don't earn his blessings. God blesses you because you carry his name. If you ever go down in that water in that name, and now you become a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his blessings on your life is not about you, it's about him. Paul writing to the Romans said that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. The word glorify, the Greek word is doxa. Doxa translates to develop an opinion about. When I glorify God, it's not me saying he's the greatest. When I glorify God, it's when I hang around him enough that I have an opinion about who he is and I start developing an opinion about what he can do, what he will do, what he desires to do. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is your Father's good pleasure. The prefix to the word good in the original text is Epsilon, Upsilon, or you which literally translates with great joy or excitement. The greatest joy God gives is when he has the privilege of pouring out a blessing on you because you respond. A few years ago, my grandson came to spend the day with us. Well, actually, he didn't come to spend the day. We took care of him every day. So he was brought there that morning. The day before, I'd promised him that I'd spend the day with him. And I knew he's going to be expecting me to fulfill my promise. So I had something I needed to do. So I moved where I usually sat. When he comes through the door, I'm not in the chair he can see. So he starts running through the house looking. And he went to every room hollering, Papa. And I never responded. I heard him go to the living room, the kitchen, the laundry room, the garage, back through the laundry room, the kitchen living room, up the stairs, all the way to the front of the house, went to the bedroom, the closet, next bedroom, closet, bedroom, closet, my room, closet, and he finally gets to the last room in the house and he can't find me and I, he's no longer running, but I can, I, I hear him as he starts walking back over me, he comes down the stairs, in a few moments, I sense a presence behind me, I know he's there, so I turned around, He's got his little hip, fist on his hip, and he said, Papa, you promised me that you'd spend a day with me. Are you going to break your promise? He said, no, Riley, but I had something I had to do. Let me get finished with it real quickly, and then I'll spend a day with you. He said, come and stand by me. So he walked over and stood beside me, and I worked for about 30 seconds, and he said, is this going to take all day? And I said, no, Riley. So I pick him up and I set him in my lap. I said, here, you help me. I put his hand on the mouse and I start moving the mouse and the Lord started talking. And the Lord said, son, what do you think you get that feeling that you have right now? See, there's no greater thrill in my life than when my kids show up and act like they enjoy being there. And there's no greater thrill in my life than when my grandkids come and act like they want to spend time with me. And the Lord says, where's that coming from? And I said, I guess it's from you, Lord. And he said, yes, and that's how I feel every time you come to my house and you act like you enjoy being there. 
So if you want to act like you enjoy being in the house of God tonight, I can guarantee you that incredible things are going to take place in this place tonight because your desire is for him to move in your life. So for a few moments tonight, I want to preach to you about the end of time. While you're returning to your seat so you can find your Bible and read with me, I hope you bring your Bibles to church or at least your technology that has a Bible in it. You know, we used to would never show up at the house of God without a Bible. What's happened to us? So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me begin reading verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That's an absolute. That's not a possibility of maybe so or something that could happen. This is what's going to happen. In the last days perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. Can I read it in a different translation? But this understand also, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For people will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders, without self-control, savage, Opposed to what is good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, loving pleasure rather than loving God. They will maintain the outward appearance of religion, but will have repudiated its power. So avoid people like these. The end of time. The Lord bless you may be seated. Before I begin tonight, Again, let me say what an incredible honor and privilege it is to be here. It's good to be with friends. Brother and Sister Dean have been friends for a long time. And if we say how long, it means we're real old because we've been friends longer than some of you have been born. <laughs> Forty plus years. <laughs> so it's, it's just an honor to be here. And I do hope and pray today that something I say will help your life to become different. Since I was here last, I've had some incredible events happen in my life. A few years ago, it's probably been eight years now, I had the privilege of meeting a young man. And after we had met, I had designed a church that he was going to build and he called and asked if I'd meet him and I said sure and so we met at a restaurant and after having had lunch we he unrolled the plans and we talked about it and when we got through he was rolling them up and I looked at him and I said Christopher I have a question for you he said all right what is your question I said are you apostolic and he ducked his head. I, I caught him by surprise. He sat there a few moments, and then he said, that's my roots, but it's not my lifestyle. I said, Christopher, what happened? He said, I guess I got disillusioned. And as he began to talk, and he began to remember his life, he got a little excited and he said, is there any real Pentecost anymore? I said, what do you mean? He said, I mean old fashioned Pentecost where somebody had to help somebody to leave because they were too drunk on the Holy Ghost to get out the door. 
Does that happen anymore? Is there church anymore where people wind up in the floor and don't know how they got there? Where they're slain under the power of God? He said, I remember as a kid, there was this lady that came to our church. She was great friends with my mom and dad, and she actually lived in our home when she came. One day, we were having lunch, and she was there. She was going to speak at our church that night, and so she was there. We were having lunch, and mom and dad and this lady started praying. And us nine kids sitting around the table, we, we, we wanted to eat, but there was just no eating that day because their prayer broke out into a prayer meeting that in just moments of time, there came knocks on the door. And when one of us kids would go answer the door, the person at the door would say, what's going on in this house? And we would say, oh, nothing, we're just having lunch. She said, no, I was walking by and I felt such power coming from this place. I want to know what's going on in this house. And he said, that day before lunch was over, 13 people had walked in off the street and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That lady's name was Sister Willie Johnson. What an incredible preacher. And then he stopped. He said, if it's real, which you say it is, I want to see it. He said, are there any prophets anymore? I said, yes, Christopher, there are. I want to meet one. So I said, okay. Are you sure you want to meet one? Yeah, I want to meet one. So I just pulled my phone out went through my contacts and dialed Gordon Pope. He only lives about 10 blocks from my house and so he answered that day. He happened to be in town by, it, was, it had to be the hand of God that did it and, and he answered and I said, Brother Pope, where are you? He said, I'm in Houston. I said, I got a guy that needs to meet you. He said, okay, when would you like to meet? I said, well, okay, Christopher. He said he can meet you. When do you want to meet him? He said, how about tomorrow? Brother Poe, will you be here tomorrow? Yeah, I don't leave till Friday, so I can meet you tomorrow. Be glad to. Where are we going to meet? So we met at another restaurant. And that day, he was introduced to Gordon Poe. And when Gordon walked away, he said, Yep, prophets are still here because he ministered to him and said things to him he had never heard in his life. And so he said, I, Brother Poe said, I'm preaching here in town this weekend. Won't you come hear me preach? And so he went to that service that Sunday. I had to go out of town to speak, and so I, I, Sunday night, as I'm leaving service, I'm in a different time zone than I actually had, I, my phone rings, and I see his name, and I answered, and Christopher said, it, it's still real. I saw old-fashioned Pentecost tonight, just like I remember as a kid. Well, since that time, Christopher's been on a journey that's changing his life. Few Months later, he called me one day and said, my dad's in town, would you like to meet him? I said, sure, I'd love to meet your dad. And so I drove across Houston, about a 45 minute drive to where he lived, and pulled up in the drive, knocked on the door, and Christopher meets me at the door, invites me in, and takes me to his, uh, his living room. There's a table set up, and his dad is sitting at this table. And when I walk up, his dad looks up, and he said, uh, Dad, I want to introduce you to James. He is an apostolic just like you are. And that old man's face lit up. What I didn't know, that was he was in the last stages of Alzheimer's. He's going to die just a few months later. And, and so his face lights up, and he, 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 he looks and he smiles. And I said, he said, Dad, you need to tell him some of your stories about Pentecost. So I sit down at that table, and he starts telling a story. He said, I remember I was about 13 years of age. And we came to church on a Sunday morning, ready to have church. And the preacher was late. He was always on time. But that day, he didn't arrive when church should have started. So we don't know what to do. We're just sitting in the audience waiting and after about 10 or 15 minutes, the door opened on the other side of the platform. And out walks the preacher. His suit's wrinkled. His shirt's wrinkled. And he steps into that pulpit. And for the first time, begins to sing without music. 
when gloom and sadness whisper, you sin, no use to pray. I look away to Jesus, and he tells me to say, I see a crimson stream of blood which flows from Calvary. Its waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. He said, as he began to sing that song, worship erupted in that place. And as worship erupted, it began to transform that entire audience that was there. And there were four to five hundred of them there that Sunday morning as he begins to worship through song that he had just received through revelation. Christopher's grandmother was G.T. Haywood's first convert when he went to Indianapolis and started the church. And so here's this kid raised who was there that day. He said the power of God was so strong in that place. People were in the floor shouting, dancing, People have been slain the spirit and about 20 minutes into worship. The back doors of the church burst open and the fire department comes running in screaming, get out, get out, get out, get out. Your building's on fire, your building's on fire. G.T. Haywood stopped singing for a moment and he said, no gentlemen, our building's not on fire, we're just having church. Neighbors saw smoke coming out of that building because the Shekinah glory of God descended just like in the Old Testament over a tabernacle on that place. And the neighborhood thought it was on fire when it was just a move of God taking place. Now that's how we got here. What's happened that's caused us not to experience what we used to? About five years ago, I had the privilege of speaking at a missionary retreat for all the missionaries of the Middle East. We met in a small city on the southwest sea coast of this country of Turkey. It's the port city where all the cruise liners dock when they bring the cruise ships in for people on the cruise to go visit the seven churches of Asia. About seven miles from our hotel, is the old ancient city of Ephesus. We drove through it, coming to the hotel. They pointed out some of the ruins you could see. And after our, our, our seminar, the, the regional director inquired, does anybody want to go see the old ancient city of Ephesus? And everybody there agreed, yes, we want to go. So they arranged the next day for us to be picked up in a bus. And so we go seven miles to this old ancient city of Ephesus. And when I walk into this place, it was, it was probably the most incredible experience I ever had in my life. I'm, I'm looking and watching and I walk through and, and I don't have time to tell you the story. I just want to tell you about what happened at the end. As we started top and we worked our way down off of uh, the pass between two mountains, down towards the, the floor of that valley where the sea coast used to be, when you walk out of that final on that lower level and you make a right hand turn and you walk about 200 yards you, you walk to the entrance of the old ancient Colosseum and so as I walked into that Colosseum that day the Lord just started flashing scriptures in my mind I, I, I start seeing and hearing the word of God as, as I walk in and, and I'm, I'm remembering Acts chapter 19 when Paul gets off the ship and he walks into that city and he meets John's disciples and he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? And I'm looking at the marketplace where that took place and, and it's, it's less than 100 yards from the entrance to this Colosseum. And so I'm, I'm standing here, I walk into this Colosseum and when I walk in, I, I can hear in my mind the chants of 100 plus thousand people that gather in this arena screaming great is Diana great is Diana great is Diana and for two hours they scream great is Diana because the church was having such an impact on that city in such a short period of time that was changing everything about the city including their religion and they're trying to hold on to the little bit that they had and keep their people aware of who they really were I don't know why I did it I just walked up the top of that Colosseum. It's, it's almost 180 degree fan shape. And I walked to the top on this side, Cito, 
right at 100,000 people, and I just start walking around the top of that old Coliseum. When I get to the far corner and I stop, I'm looking down at the old marble road that Paul walked up on his way to meet John's disciple. And standing there, the Lord started flashing scripture in front of my mind. I can read it like a billboard. And when I'm standing there, 2 Timothy chapter 3 just appeared. And the Lord says, read it. And out loud, I'm at the top of this Coliseum. There's not anybody really close. But if they look, they're seeing old man talking. They may think he's lost his mind talking to somebody. But I started reading it out loud just like I read it to you tonight. In the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural faith. And as I began to read it and I got to the end where I read to you that they will become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They will maintain the outward appearance of religion. They'll look like God on the outside, but they will have denied its power. The Lord said, who's this written to? And instantly I responded, well, that's what my world's going to look like, Jesus, when you come. He said, no, son, read it again. And when I read it the second time, I realized these characteristics are not characteristics of the world. It's characteristics of what the church is going to look like at the end of time. At the end of time, the number one problem that's going to start showing up that produces the other 19 is lovers of themselves. The only form of idol worship you'll find in the New Testament is found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The word covetous means to desire more, to want more, to take more, to receive more. Covetous is selfish, self-centeredness. When you become selfish and self-centered, you start worshiping flesh. Romans chapter 1 said, When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. They became vain in their imagination. Their foolish hearts are darkened. They worship the creature more than the Creator. The biggest problem we're going to encounter at the end of time is people thinking they're more important than anybody else and you've got to meet whatever I need. I used to hear a question about 15 years ago that irritated me to no end. The question I heard on a regular basis was, is this a heaven or hell issue? I heard it so many times that it made me angry. And after I got angry one day, the Lord said, you're, the problem is you're, you're listening to the wrong question. The question they're really asking, they don't have the courage to ask. They're not asking about whether or not it'll keep them out of heaven. What they really want you to give them is, is the, a, a set of rules that's the least they have to do to get by. So they want you to draw a line somewhere to show them if I cross this line, I'm in trouble. When you ask the question, is this a heaven or hell issue, the real question is, what's the least I have to do to get by? Now, I've been married 46 plus years, 47 come August the 4th, and I can guarantee you my marriage would have never lasted 46 plus years if I ever asked that lady at my house one time, honey, what's the least amount of my time you need? Honey, what's the least amount of affection I need to show you? Honey, what's the least amount of hugs I need to give you every day? Just draw, give me a number so I at least pass that number every day. Marriage is selling the whole thing. Living for God is not giving part to God. It's giving all to God. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure you find in the field. That when you find it, you sell all that you have and you buy the treasure. No, you buy the field. You buy snakes, scorpions, lizards, skunks. You buy things you don't want because there's a treasure in it. And you have to buy the entire field to get the treasure. Now I don't hear that question anymore. I hear a new one. 
And the new question I'm hearing from Pentecostals is, Brother Hughes, don't you think I have a right to be happy? We don't even care if we're going to heaven anymore. All we want to know is make sure somebody makes me happy. I got a right, and if this one's not making me happy, there's got to be somebody out there making me happy. Somewhere I'm going to find happiness. And, and it's, it's an elusive dream, but I'm going to find it. I've got a right to be happy. You spoiled brat. Go up, grow up, act like an adult, and get happy. Nobody's going to make you happy. You won't be happy. Go get in front of the mirror and practice your happy face. Happiness starts on the inside, not the outside. There's not a human alive that can make any other human happy. God's not obligated to make you happy. No one's obligated to make you happy. You want happiness, then you find God and the joy, not happiness of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation joy comes from the inside not the outside happiness is your choice my world is making me believe that I got all these rights you know it came from the declaration of independence all men are created under God with certain able rights among these are life liberty and the pursuit of What's the word pursue mean? To chase. It's running. You've got to chase it. You want happiness? You're going to chase it. No. You want happiness? Then get happy. You declare this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day has no asterisk that says it has to be sun shining. It could be raining. It could be storming. There could be snowing out. It doesn't matter the conditions of the day. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Can I just be honest? Can I be an old man on a soapbox? We're the whiningest bunch of people that exist. If one little thing goes wrong in our lives, we throw our hands up, get mad at God, and say, God just don't care no more. You spoiled brat. Grow up. You know, I've never had to help anybody in 30 plus years of doing this. Never had to help anybody acting like an adult. Never. Everybody shows up and wants to talk to me. The adult will never be present. See, you don't have a clue what you look like. You don't have a clue how old you are. If you didn't have a mirror, you'd have no clue. I'm old, but I don't think I am because I can't see old. Unless I have a mirror to look at, and I look at the mirror and say, whoa, something happened to that guy. But that's not the guy I know. Guy, I know he's ageless. He, he, he's got ideas and dreams about things even at 68 that, that he still wants to see happen. See, you, you, you can't see you. By the way, you don't, you, you don't preach on holiness? You don't need a Bible. If you can't see you, then what in the world can you do to the outside of you to make you feel one bit better? When you had to focus on the outside, you put God on the outside. When you had to focus on the outside, that means the inside's real messed up. So when you have to change the package to get people to look at you, pay attention to you, that means you think you're worthless or broke or defective because you've got to fix it to make everybody else want to respond to it. So you let your world convince you you're broke. That's America. America is a free market capitalistic society. You know what that means? I got a product I want to sell you. The only way I'm going to convince you to buy it is to break you. If you're not deficient without it, you're not going to spend one penny on it. But if I can make you feel totally worthless, you'll buy everything I've got. 
How much junk you have at your house that doesn't do one bit of good, but you bought it because you thought it was going to help your life? You buy little glass boxes that, that'll cook a, kitchen, uh, a, a chicken w while you're going to work. The biggest gift given away last Christmas was an Instant Pot. You can put it all in a pot, plug it in, set the timer, and before you get home, your meal's prepared and you don't have to do no work. But everything tastes alike, but you don't have... Potatoes taste like steak, carrots taste like steak, whatever's in the bottom's gonna taste, everything's gonna taste like, but, but you got a meal. See, we, we, we buy things that, that prove how defective we are. And we come here and we're, we're kids of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and we drag sack lunches to the greatest banquet ever prepared. When you come to this house, you can walk away every time fully satisfied if you want to. You, you can walk away having experienced the most incredible experiences you can have in your life because you choose to enter, be entertained by the presence of God and you choose to dine at His table, not your table. Old man talking. How did we get here? What happened to us? Can, can I just give you my description of us? We don't have a clue where we're going or what we're doing. How'd we get here? Well, I remember being in youth camp in 1967 when Israel took back Jerusalem. And I promise you, I was convinced I would never live to get married. Because that started the end of time. More than seven years. That's by 74. It's all over. And we preached on prophecy to the point we convinced everybody it was going to happen. And when it didn't happen, people got disillusioned. So it changed from 74 to 80. And it changed from 80 to 88 greatest revival America seen in Pentecost happened in the summer of 1988. My church I attended had 500 backsliders pray through in the month of August. 500 because they circulated that little book 88 Reasons Why the Lord's Come 1988 and people read it and they believed in it and, and they were convinced and they did show up at church and you're to hear people asking one another if the Lord comes you think I might be ready to go if you see any flaw in me or if you see me doing something like just let me know. I, I, I want to be submitted to you. But it didn't happen. Y2K showed up. The world's supposed to collapse. You bought food and stuck it in places that food probably shouldn't be. And, and you were convinced you dug cellars and put food in it. We have churches that pack their basements full of food because the world's going to end and money's going to fall apart. And it didn't happen. Now here we stand at 2019 and there's no Pentecostal past the age of 50 that ever believed you'd live to see 2019 because it was supposed to be over. So we quit preaching about the coming of the Lord. We quit preaching conviction. Now all of a sudden we got all these people that don't know how to respond or feel about themselves. Life started breaking things. And so now we become cheerleaders. And we try to encourage you to participate. David said, I was glad when they said unto me. David wasn't a priest. David had no right to go to the house of God. I was glad when they said unto me. See, all David could do is bring his sacrifice to the front door and repent and confess over the sacrifice that was slain. That's as far inside the house of God as he could get because he was not a priest. But he was glad when they said, let us go. And the church used to be the most important thing in our life. Getting people to church today is the most difficult thing. Sundays used to be our biggest service. Because all of a sudden we knew Sunday night we were going to have an outpouring and all kinds of things were going to happen. And there was a reason. 
You rub shoulders with the world all week long. You come home feeling dirty and filthy because you've heard people say things and you've been involved in conversations around junk that just made you feel worthless. And when you finally get the house of God on Sunday morning, that Sunday morning was a time of washing because you're washed by the Word. And when the Word was preached on a Sunday morning and you walked away, you walked away refreshed. So when you come back Sunday night, you didn't have the world on you. You had church on you. So it was easy to show up on a Sunday night and walk into the atmosphere and all of a sudden we begin to worship and pray and, and, and God began to move in our midst and we saw incredible things happen. I remember sitting on the pulpit of the church I attended as a kid, a little glass jar, a little bit smaller than that glass of water. It's about this tall. Inside of it was a cancer about this big round. It nearly filled the entire jar. That cancer had been located on the left temple of the pastor's granddaughter. It had grown through the skull, attached the roots into the brain, and the doctor said it's not operable and she's going to die in a very short period of time. They lived in Dallas, Texas. They brought her to Wichita Falls. Now my mom had been healed of cancer few years before that and that Sunday night they brought her to the front they prayed for her nothing happened that night they took her home Monday nothing happened Tuesday she's running through the house and that cancer turned loose roots and all and fell out on the floor and left a hole on the side of her head where it used to be because God caused it to stop growing and it detached itself and fell off That was the trophy that sat on the pulpit of the church I attended as a kid. There were crutches around the wall. There were places that had wheelchairs on the wall because incredible things happened and we marked the memory of those things that took place. But when I let life convince me that I'm more important than anything else and that life revolves around me, and my needs. I, I, I go to the, I will not go to the Christian bookstore anymore. I quit. I got fed up with the trash that I saw on the shelf and I refused to go. The titles made me want to throw up. I walked through those aisles and read titles like his needs, her needs. I wanted to gag and puke right there in the floor. His needs, her needs. Look at the head of the person beside you and see if there's a USB port. You can't plug in a wire and download a data bank. There's not a person in the world that knows what your needs are. Grow up, act like an adult, meet your own needs. It's not your wife's responsibility to meet your needs. It's not your husband's responsibility to meet your needs. The only people who need their needs met are kids. I told you I've never had to deal with adults. It's adults that show up acting like a six-year-old. Or a 12-year-old. You say, we don't act like that. Of course you do. If you ever lose it and get angry, your greatest mental capacity is six. So every time you get mad, you're not an adult. You're a screaming child. A fit-throwing child is what you become. If fear shows up in your life, your greatest mental capacity is 12. 12 year olds are gangsters they run in pack if fear shows up you'll never do it alone you'll get everybody on your side and they'll get everybody on their side and y'all go to war I'd never have a job if people acted like adults but I'm never going to be without a job because no matter how loud I scream it and no matter how much I say about it it doesn't change anything because when I get through tonight, I can guarantee you somebody will walk up and say, but you don't understand what's going on in my life. I don't care what's going on in your life and it don't matter. Get over it. There's no rewind button. You're not going to back it up, play it again. You're not going to fix it. You're not going to change it. You're going to forgive it and let the stupid thing go. Quit dragging it to church in a sack. It stinks. The thing's dead and rotting. Get rid of it. 
I gave you the answer this morning. Get rid of it. You get lost in tongues for a while in the presence of God and you'll walk away without any junk in your life. We become selfish. Now I don't have time to go through that list. And don't intend to. So we're not going to be here all night. But I do want to jump to the last part of that list because here's where you wind up. And here's where incredible problems start happening. They become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know what America, what, what the medical field says today is the greatest addiction in America right now? The greatest addiction. You think it's heroin? You think it's crack, crank, meth? You, you, you think it's fentanyl? Or any of the other synthetics that, that humans can put in their body? Is that, is it alcohol? Is that our greatest addiction? You really want to know? Actually, it was on Fox News this afternoon. I flipped it open and, and, and had to check something, and, and it popped up as a screen. And that, that, I mean, it just jumped out. I, if you charge your phone by your bed, the medical world says you're addicted to it. If you dare open it when you wake up in the night to see if somebody connected to you, you're addicted to it. So we, we, we've let things in our life that are more dangerous than anything else we could ever let in our life. We're letting things in our life control us that have the power to destroy us. The problem with this generation is they don't know how to develop a relationship because they don't know how to communicate. They think texting is communication, that is conversation. But conversation requires tongue, vocal cords, and eyeballs. It doesn't require just tongues and vocal cords because you can do that on the phone. But without your eyes being involved, your conscience can never be active. It requires your conscience looking at the person you're saying something to and reading their expressions to know if you're crossing a line, if you're saying something that hurts or injures, or if you're going to destroy them by your words. If you can't look at them, you have no clue what your words are doing to them. So we've let our world sell us stuff that has the ability to destroy us. And as a result, we have some problems. So I need to address something tonight that that's, you're not going to like in the least bit and you probably will want me to leave as soon as I get through. Scientists were trying to discover where pleasure resides in the human brain. They discovered it by accident. They were studying the limbic system. The brain is protected by bone. You can't get in there, so if you try to mess with it, you destroy it. So all they had was dead things to examine or just observation. And they discovered that if they could take a piece of wire 10 times smaller than a human hair and coat it so that it was protected all the way except the tip, they could insert that little piece of, of wire into the brain of, of an animal and stimulate it with a very small electrical charge without killing or destroying the animal or doing brain damage. So as they were studying and they started trying to find what controls us, the first thing they started studying is the limbic system and, and, and how it functions and what resides there. Fear, anger, need for food, water, and sex drive. Those five things reside in your brain stem. So they discovered that by sending a little minute electrical charge into the brain of an animal, they could make it hungry. They then taught the animal how to feed itself by pushing buttons so that it could get its own food when they pushed the button and feed themselves. And so they'd trigger 
the little mechanism, it'd send a little impulse, the, the, the animal would get hungry, it'd go over and push a button, food would fall out, and they'd start eating. Now, they became very obese because they ate when they really didn't need to eat because someone was messing with their brain. They could make them thirsty. By accident one day, they got the electrode in the wrong spot. And when they sent this impulse, the animal didn't respond at all. It just laid down the bottom of the cage and sprawled out like it was on a high. They could bring predatory animals around it that should terrify it and make it want to run and hide, and they'd just lay there and look at them. They couldn't terrify it. They couldn't make it angry. They couldn't do anything. It would rather just lay here and feel whatever's happening than do anything else. And so they decided to see if that just this was an accident with one. So they took x-rays of the brain, realized they're off by just centimeters. And, and, and so they relocated the, the same electrodes in 58 other animals and sent the same impulse and they all laid in the bottom of the cage just spread out and, and, and laid there and just enjoyed whatever they were enjoying. Well, by accident, they had just discovered the part of your brain that's now called the nucleus accumbens and it's your pleasure center. And when you experience pleasure of any kind, it causes that part of your brain, which is about the size of a walnut, it's located between your ears, right behind your eyes, just above the brain still, when you experience pleasure of any kind, it triggers a release of that area of the brain, a, a flood of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And when dopamine floods the brain, it causes you to have this elated high or euphoria. Then they start trying to find out what caused it. Well, just stick a sugar cube in your mouth and suck on it and your brain will thump that little area and boom, you'll feel this, ooh, that feels real good. Put a piece of chocolate in your mouth, let it melt, and boom, the brain enjoys it. And then they started wondering, what controls this mechanism? That could really get out of control. So as they studied it and then developed ways of examining the brain, they discovered that from the nucleus accumbens, there are thousands of nerves that run from there to the frontal lobe. And that's where your conscience resides. So they discovered that when you experience pleasure, your brain sends a message to the frontal lobe and says, you're experiencing pleasure. Your conscience then examines the pleasure you're experiencing and decides if it's good for you, if it's bad for you, if it's healthy or unhealthy, if it's dangerous, and if the brain thinks that what you're doing could damage your life, it'll send a message back to stop. And if you respond and stop, then your brain, your conscience has controlled pleasure. However, if you ignore the warning and you just keep enjoying the pleasure, your brain cannot stand confusion. It has an ability called plasticity. And whatever message brought, our nerve brought the message because the brain can't stand confusion and you won't listen to it, it'll just unplug the nerve that brought it so that there's no pathway to the frontal lobe. There are thousands of those pathways but over a nine month period of time, you have the power to unplug every connection between pleasure and conscience. And at that point in your life, you're either gonna become an addict or you're gonna do something really bad that's gonna wreck your life. Affairs don't happen casually. God put a mechanism inside of you to keep you from doing something really dumb to wreck your life and somebody else's life. So when, when, when something starts happening that you shouldn't do and your conscience says stop and you argue with your conscience and says, well, what harm can come? She just told me I look nice or, or he just told me I look nice. Well, what damage can happen? And the conscience is saying, don't go there. That's, that's not your wife. That's not your husband. Don't, don't go down that road. That's dangerous. And you ignore the warning. Brain unplugs the messenger 
that brought the message so that the message can't come back. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. See, America's addicted to pleasure. You can't go to an amusement park in America that doesn't have a connection to pleasure. The longest rides in the amusement park are not the paddle boats. It's the ride that has a list of diseases. If you have, don't get on it. If you've got heart problems, pregnancy, if you've got blood pressure, you've got diabetes, there, there's at least 20 items listed on, that, on, on the sign that says, if you've got anything, do not get on this ride. But it's the longest ride in the park. It'll take you an hour, an hour and a half just to get through to get on it so you can be terrorized. So that you can get an adrenaline rush, that you can, get, you, you, you can have a fear factor that'll pump that adrenaline. You'll, you'll get a pleasure form out of this that'll cause you to get addicted to it and you think you gotta have it on a regular basis. And now all of a sudden, all these problems start showing up. How'd they get here? So it takes you about nine months to get God out of your life. And then at the end of nine months, God can't talk anymore. There's no pulpit for God to step into because he preaches from your conscience. And when God has no connection to your conscience, you're going to do something you wish you had never done. And once you do something you wish you had never done, then you realize, oh, I made a horrible mistake. And now you start trying to fix the damage that you caused as a result of letting pleasure control you. See, pleasure is not your friend. It will wreck your life. And anything I do to let pleasure get out of control that becomes something I got to do over and over and over again. That's why when you slide this little thing out and have to, scientists say the mere moving of your finger, they've taken spec scans of you while you do it. The mere moving of your finger across that screen, sliding it releases dopamine in the brain and you get addicted to it. The scourge of America is Facebook. But we have sucked it up and embraced it and love it like it's the greatest thing. And Fox News today said that America knows it's the worst thing that America has ever created. It's the most deceitful thing that America has ever created. But yet, we can't give it up, even though we know how damaging it is. Matter of fact, let me just point out, if you have a Facebook page, you are 35% more likely to wind up in a divorce court just by having one. 80 plus percent of all divorce decrees filed in America today mention Facebook. If you're involved in a car wreck and you get sued by their, the, whoever you have a wreck with and they sue your insurance for claim, the first place they're gonna go is your social media to find out what kind of pictures you post. And if there's ever one of these things like this, but what's this called? A what? Y'all not saying, what, what's it called? Tell me we're not selfish and self-centered. When you have more pictures of you than anybody else, it's just become your mirror. You gotta find out if you look good, so you take a picture. You're gonna have to look at it. Oh. You can't even have conversations. You, you can't go to a restaurant and say, the business world don't know what to do with this generation because they can't have board meetings because the people there can't leave their phones alone. And it has the power to wreck everything around us because we're so addicted to it, we can't lay it down. We have to keep it in our midst at all times. And the pleasure of that sliding, just slide your finger across the screen you're going to release the same neurotransmitter that heroin does, crack does, crank, meth, alcohol. Whatever drug you can put in your body, you've just done the same thing that drug does your body because you don't get addicted to heroin. 
you get addicted to what heroin does to your body. You don't get addicted to alcohol. You get addicted to what alcohol does to the body. And what alcohol and heroin do to the body is release your neurotransmitters, produce dopamine, which causes you to have this, this euphoria, and that's what you get addicted to. And so just sliding your finger across the screen, and when someone posts something you like or you did, and you get a like or a thumbs up, you just get this warm fuzzies all over because you just got an adrenaline rush. Okay, I don't want to bust your bubble, but I don't care what you eat nor where you eat it. And you're not important enough for the world to know that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where we've got this inflated ego that everybody needs to know where I've been, what I've done, because i got to post. I can't wait to post it. You go do something really dumb. Take a picture and post it and get offended when someone says something about it. We're mindless. We're at the end of time. We're here. It's not something in the future. We, that prophecy tells us the coming of the Lord is closer right now than it's ever been because the church has begun to look like the characteristics that are defined by what Paul said to Timothy, the pastor of this church at Ephesus. That letter was sent to this church that I'm standing here watching. The Lord asked me after I'd started reading all this stuff. He said, what do you see, son? And I look and I said, ruins. And his response was, I warned them. I told them I'd remove their candlestick. And Ephesus ceased to exist somewhere around 460 A.D., shortly after it became the site of the council that deified Mary and made her a god. And the worship of Mary, the mother of Jesus, showed up at the council of Ephesus. And in a short period of time, an earthquake shook the place, and the two mountains on either side buried it, and it was buried under hundreds of ground or feet of of, of dirt that fell off the side of those mountains and the city didn't exist anymore. Folks, God's serious. You think God don't care what you're doing or how you're doing it? You're totally wrong. God's serious about the end of time, His church, and what His bride's going to look like at the end of time. See, my Bible says that God prophesied in the last day that the latter rain will be seven times the former rain. If you get the latter rain and the former rain together, which it also prophesies, that means the last day revival has to be eight times greater than the book of Acts. Now I want to know who's looking for that revival that's eight times the book of Acts. Well, the only way we're going to get to that place is to get our conscience back and not be afraid of people preaching us to our knees instead of to our feet. We're not going to be afraid when a preacher gets to a pulpit and he starts preaching the word of God and you want to crawl under a pew and hide because conviction shows up and you're responding to the convicting power of God. When we get to that place, revival's going to happen in our world. The worst addiction that's happening after this sliding of mechanism of, and it's actually a product of that little thing you can hold in your hand, is the porn addiction of America has gone out of control. 15 years ago, 5% of females in America were, were addicted to porn because women don't respond to what they see. And so there was no need or reason for them to get addicted. Today, the newest re Research says, the newest statistics say that 47% of females today are addicted to porn. They have grown in addiction faster than men have. Now it's an addiction everywhere. I think we missed it, Brother Dean. We have defined spirituality by how often you pray, how much you speak in tongues, how much you read the Bible. And that's what makes you a spiritual person. So we've given people a crutch. 
that's really not the right answer. I can't find in my Bible where it says that. But what I can find in the New Testament is that what defines whether or not you're spiritual is how often you get up every day and fight your flesh and win. Spirituality is defined by you conquering you, not about how much you pray or how much you fast because nobody knows you but you. Spirituality is defined by how often you stand in front of a mirror and say, you know, I know who you are. I know what you're doing. And you're not going to wreck nobody's life today. You're going to be controlled. You're not going to get out of control. I will control you. And if you think you're going to ruin my life, you've got a second thought. Now, when I walk away, I'll never see you again. But tonight, before we go to bed, we're going to have this conversation again. And we're going to find out who won today. And if I come back tonight and I have conquered you, I'm going to rub your nose in the fact that you didn't win the day I won. However, if by chance you win today, when I come back tonight and I look at you and say, you know what, you conquered me today, but here's what's going to happen. Tomorrow you don't get breakfast, you don't get lunch, and you don't get supper. If that don't get your attention, the next day you don't get breakfast, you don't get lunch, you don't get your uh, supper. If that don't get your attention the next day, I'm, I will, you're not controlling my life. Do you hear me? I'm talking to you. See, spirituality is defined by how much you fight you and win. And when you conquer you, you change the world. Instead of giving in to you and letting pleasure control us or our selfishness control us, I look at that guy and say, you know what? You are a sorry, rotten, no good scoundrel. You just want to wreck people's lives. You say dumb things on purpose. If you do that today, tomorrow, I'll control you because scientists have discovered that fasting takes control of your brain quicker than anything else you can do. It will control your brain quicker than prayer will. So if you'll just starve yourself occasionally, you'll get your flesh under control. If you'll look in that mirror and admit, okay, you're the problem. You got a real issue. I'm on control. You're not controlling me. You're not wrecking my life. You know what I'm discovering about getting old? You don't mellow with age. The 68-year-old version of James Hughes is not better than the 21. He's not more patient. He's not kinder. He's not more long-suffering. He's not gentle. He doesn't have more faith. The 68-year-old, is a, he, he can be a jerk real quick. And I'm discovering that all it takes to be a jerk is an opportunity. It's in us. Now, we're afraid to get honest. If I don't get you to laugh, you'll, you won't be able to handle what I'm saying. If I can get you to laugh about it a little bit, then you'll be able to take what I'm saying. But the real problem in the world is not the world. So you don't need a devil to go to hell. You just need him to blame. Without a good devil, you cannot exist. As of today, nobody's ever showed up at my office and said, Brother Hughes, Mr. Hughes, Dr. Hughes, whatever they call me. No one showed up and said, Brother Hughes, you're looking at a problem. Everybody I talk to is going to blame a wife, a husband, a mom, a dad, brother, a sister, an aunt, and uncle. Somebody else calls it a problem. I ain't had nothing to do with it. Hardest thing the world do is get you to take ownership of your life and get you to take over your life so that your life's not controlling you, that you're controlling your life. You have the power to do that. He gave you every resource necessary to take over your life and totally control your life so your life don't control you. But don't find a prayer room as a cop out. I got a phone call a few years ago. Pastor said, I need you to come to my town. It's okay. When? How soon you get here? I just landed. I, I, I can come there. No, 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 no. I need you real quick. You, how quick? Well, tomorrow. Can you get here tomorrow? My wife's here in the conversation. She says, it's okay. She's very patient. And, and, and so I said, okay. But you know how much it's going to cost? I don't care what it costs. I, I got to have you. You got to be here tomorrow. Okay. Made a ticket. 1200 plus bucks. Got on an airplane. Flew about two hours to get there. Got off the plane. Picked me up to the airport. 45 minute drive to his church. It's on the way. He tells me, I need you to talk to a family in my church. They're the greatest people. And he starts telling me all they do. She's the ladies prayer coordinator. She, she leads. If there's a problem in church, she's the one you call. He's our men's minister. And, and, and there's just all this. They're, they're so affecting my church. And and, and I really need your help. I said, well, what's wrong? They're going to get a divorce. I said, what? 
she's the prayer director and he's the men's leader and they're getting a divorce. What, what's wrong here? He says, I don't know. They, they got a problem. I need some help. Well, he knew what the problem was. He just wouldn't tell me. He later admitted it when I confronted him. So I, I, I show up and walk in. I spend an hour with her, hour with him, hour with them. Three hours. Her, him, them. He picks me up, takes me to the airport on the way. He said, what do you think? I said, you wasted your money. He said, no, I did not. He said, you wasted your money. But they're going to get a divorce. No, they are not going to get a divorce. Oh, yes, they are. She said she should. I don't care what she said. They're not getting divorced. They enjoy fighting, and they enjoy getting you in the middle of it, and they're using church as their addiction. They have two boys in their 20s. They've both been in and out of re drug rehab eight times. The youngest one's just getting out. You know what the problem was? You really want to know what the problem was? You know why they're going to get a divorce? He owns the largest heating and air conditioning company in his town of almost two million people. His yearly sales are over hundred million dollars a year. She has a brand new car sitting in the driveway every January. All she's got to do is tell him what he wants, she wants. It's in the driveway. She's drove Bentleys, Rolls, Mercedes, Jags, whatever she has a flair for that year. It's in the driveway, and she gets to drive a brand new car every day. This whole thing is over the fact he cut her allowance. She used to get ten thousand dollars a month to blow. Now he only gives her five, and she's mad because he won't give her more than five thousand dollars a month pocket change. She don't spend it on food. She don't spend it on clothes. She don't spend it on bills. This is money to blow. I said every lady in your church will line up to take her position in a heartbeat. <laughs> she's not about to walk out of that. She's got a cash cow. She just wants everybody to know she's mad because you've let her use the church as an addiction. Why is she at church praying for everybody else when her own house is a wreck? When you can't fix your house, you're going to drag your problem into a prayer room and you think you're going to fix your problem in a prayer room and so prayer is going to become your addiction to fix your problem and that's not what God intended for prayer to be. Prayer is not your addiction. It's your relationship. See, prayer is you learning God and talking to God and developing the ability to have a conversation with dad and dad talk back to you. And so you have an interchange with God on a regular basis through your conscience. You don't know where God speaks. He stands in the pulpit of your conscience and speaks because that's what he put in you to speak through. So when my conscience is active, I hear God. I hear what God says. I don't need a preacher. I don't need somebody giving me a word. Y'all drive Brother Poe nuts. Because we've had conversations about this. Every time you see him, you want to know, has God give you a word for me? Won't you go to a prayer room and get your own word? You think, oh, I'm old man on soapbox, forgiven old man. How'd we get here? Why is our families in chaos? Why are relationships having so many problems today? Is it because of the world? No, not the world. See, I'm convinced you don't need a devil to go to hell. You need a family to go to hell. It's what you do to each other that wrecks lives. It's words you say. It's deeds you commit against each other. It's things like, I hate you. I wish you weren't born. You're stupid. You're dumb. You can't do anything. Those are things that destroy. In the tongue is the power of life and death, according to the Word of God. According to science, it's in the tongue that you heal DNA or you destroy DNA. So we, we let our words become the weapons that we use to destroy and wreck life, and we are destroying one another. I want my life changed. First thing I have to do is admit I need a change. And when I admit I need a change, then things are going to start happening. I don't need pleasure as an addiction. 
See, here's the problem with porn. Your children's brains do not get hardwired until puberty is nearly over. Your children don't have a conscience until somewhere between the ages of 12 and 18. And it's usually about 15 to 16 that their conscience starts showing up. You can't expect them to have a conscience because God didn't let their brains connect until puberty is never, nearly over. It's when they leave childhood and grow into adulthood and they become an adult that the conscience kicks in and you're their conscience until they're 15, 16 years of age. So would you please be the parent at your house instead of the next kid at your house? Would you please parent your children instead of being a friend to your kids? Your kids don't need you as a friend. They need you as a parent. They need for you to stand up and say, no, thus says the word Lord, this is what we're going to do. Well, why? Because I said so. And that's good enough. I don't have to defend myself. My word is law and gospel at this house. You get married, you have kids, and your word becomes law and gospel at your house. At this house, my words matter. And I say no. I don't have to defend it. I say no. Well, Johnny, I don't care what Johnny does. At this house, this is the way we're going to live life. As for me and my house, as for me and my house, I, I, could, I need to quit. I, I could go all kinds of places tonight. How much of a conscience do you have? When people hurt, do you blow them off and say, oh, they deserve it? That means something happened to your conscience. When you see someone in despair, how do you respond? See, Jesus told us that we need to pay attention to our world and how we interact. Because he, read the Sermon on the Mount. There's all kinds of stuff in there about relating to each other. Matter of fact, the whole thing is about how I relate to you and how we relate to each other. And my relationship to my family is the most important thing in my life. I get in trouble so much because I don't run this stuff through a couple of times before I say it. So at the missions conference retreat with the missionaries, I made the statement, if you save the world and lose your kids, you haven't been very successful. And I got attacked. So but I couldn't even get through. And they had ganged around me and, and started giving me reasons why their kids weren't in church. Hello? It's sad that we keep less than 10% of our young people. We should keep them all. See, if you lived at home, what you do at church, your life would be a little bit different. See, we don't have to be a Christian anywhere but here. We don't have to do it at home. But I remember as a kid, Mom and Dad, my dad was just a good saint. He was not a preacher. My dad never preached a sermon in his life. My dad was an auto mechanic that had his own garage. We'd sit down at the dining room table and Mom and Dad start praying for our food. That, our food might get cold on regular occasion. Our food got cold because Mom and Dad start praying over our food and the Spirit of God just come in that house and all of a sudden, they just, and, and then us kids, we, we'd kind of join in too because, I mean, it just, it was kind of contagious and We'd forget about what's happening. We, we, we were enjoying just having a conversation with God. Now most families don't even meet together. We don't understand why we've got a problem. The reason God can't give America revival is God's family is so dysfunctional it killed all the new babes that showed up. If we don't get our families in order, Revival is not going to happen in America. And that can only happen when we recognize I need to take ownership of me. All these problems that are happening are not caused by outside forces or outside influences. My wife's not ticking me off. If I've got a short fuse and I'm a type A personality, which is just an excuse to be a jerk, if I've got a type A personality and I'm high strung, well, go to, go, go to the hardware store and get you a longer fuse or at least get you an extinguisher. When it gets lit, you can put it out. You're not a child. Grow up. 
See, the whole purpose of preaching, anybody read Ephesians? Do you know why there, there's five aspects of the ministry, not six, not seven? We, we, we've, we've changed the Bible a little bit. That's, that's a different sermon. But, but, but we, we've changed. what There are five parts of the five-fold ministry in the New Testament. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Five-fold, not six, not seven, not something else. Five. Why is there a five-fold ministry? Why did Paul said he'd give us a five-fold ministry? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints till we all grow up. It's in the Bible. Read it. It's in Ephesians chapter 4. Till we all grow up in Christ. The whole purpose of what I'm doing is just to get you to act like an adult. If all of us acted like an adult, your pastor wouldn't have nobody to talk to. But we won't do it. It's easier to throw our fits, act like two-year-olds, scream, holler, rant, and rave than it is because we are fulfilling this selfish, self-centered thing that I'm more important than anybody else. I'm not important. My kids are. My wife is. My grandkids are. And the older I get, the more aware I become of what my behavior can do to their life and that my behavior can destroy them if I'm not careful. So I have to work diligently at controlling this flesh. And I, I gotta be honest. And, and let me show you how, can I just be real honest? Does, does it bother you if I'm transparent? I'm driving down the street, got the 11 year old sitting beside me. He and I are having a conversation. I look in my mirror and I see a car approaching me like I'm sitting still. I look at my, my speedometer, I'm five miles over the speed limit. I'm thinking, whoa, we're about to get hit. I look in my next mirror and, and there's a car beside me. And, and this guy approaching me like I'm sitting still, it, he, he's not putting no brakes on. So I mean, I'm about to get hit, so I do the survival thing. I punch that supercharger on that pickup, and he just jumped out in front of the car, and, and he whipped beside me, and then he whipped in front of me. And without a bat of an eye, the 11-year-old says, you dipstick. If you can't drive any better than that, take that thing home and park it before you kill the rest of us. And you realize this 11 year old has no clue where dipstick came from. That's from the 70s, not the 2000 teens. Apparently those are words I've said because I said them enough, he's memorized them and he quoted them apparently with the same distinction that I quoted them. I have to work on this flesh because this flesh has got some real problems. And this flesh is wrecking people's lives that are around me. And I gotta work on it. The end of time is here. It's not gonna get better, it's gonna get worse. If you think this pleasure thing is, is gonna be a, a change, that's not gonna happen. It's only gonna get worse as time starts coming to an end and people crawl up on the throne of their lives and they become God instead of putting Jesus there. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about United Pentecostals that crawl up on the throne of their life and become the God of their own life and everybody has to please them instead of pleasing God. Now, I've got some good news for you. You want your conscience back? You can have it back. You know how you get your conscience back? Quit. Don't do it again. Scientists have discovered if you can go nine months without committing the behavior, that behavior will never control you again. So whatever you got addicted to, if you can go nine months without the addiction, it won't ever control you again. Nine months. Now, what, isn't that kind of strange? How long does it take you to get in this world? It takes you nine months to get reborn. Now, they've discovered that fasting and prayer will help you get it back a little bit quicker. 
depend on how much time you want to spend. Fasting and prayer. You got to use the two of them together, recognizing where the problem is, and you can control you through prayer and fasting quickly. Andrew Newberg says 12 minutes of prayer on a daily basis creates new dendrites and new synaptic connection. So if you want your brain to grow and get better, then spend a little time talking to Jesus. If you'll just spend some time in his presence, and then you can start looking at you and realizing the real battle is not the world. The real battle starts in my house, in my relationship to my wife, and my relationship to my kid, and I'm going to start treating my wife like Jesus treats his church. See, ladies or gentlemen, your wife is not obligated to be submitted to you. If you haven't proven to her, you'll die for her. As Christ gave himself for the church, that proves submission. Please stand, I'm through. Now, I've made you really uncomfortable tonight. I've watched your, I can't read a mind and I beg God don't tell me or show me one thing anybody thinks. And as of today, he's, he's kept what I've asked him not to do. I don't get revelations. Don't ask me for a word because I've asked God not to give it to me, okay? But I have been trained to read faces. And your faces don't like what I said tonight. We don't like it when someone confronts us and we have to look at ourselves. We don't like it when the light shows up and we realize the real problem is me, not somebody else. It's uncomfortable. But when I was a kid, it didn't matter what I thought. They could hang me over hell and I could feel the heat. Arlen Ray Foss, where my wife grew up and, and, and they, he and his dad married my wife and I, he, he, could, he could hang you over the pits of, fire, of hell. You could feel it in his preaching. Before he died, he made a statement. I heard it. I was at his 80th anniversary of his church, and I asked him, Brother, Brother Foss, I heard you said, anybody can preach people their knees, but very few people, or preach, preach people their feet, but very few people can preach them their knees. Did you say it? He said, yes, I said it, and I meant every word of it. See, we want to stand up and receive instead of hit the floor and change. It's easier to develop the addiction than the relationship. Because if you develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to enjoy spending time in his presence, just having conversations with him. You enjoy asking him to give you directions, do things, and he's going to take you places you'd have never imagined in your life you could go because you develop this relationship with him. And, and you have this ability to sit down and say, Jesus, to my friend, Brother Stone King called me a few months ago and he said, James, I was, I, I was spending time this year and I, it was cold and snowing. I, I was trapped and couldn't go nowhere. And he said, one morning I got up. And I, he said, I simply pray, Jesus, I want a different kind of relationship with you today. I just need you to be my dad today. Would you just show up and be my dad today? Would you come into my life like my father? He said, the most incredible presence of the Lord filled my house. He said, I, I don't know how long I got lost in spirit, speaking in tongues and praying. He said, it was hours. It, it may have been four or five hours later that I finally realized how much time I've been spending in the presence of the Lord because I simply said, Jesus, would you be my dad today? Because that's what he wants. He wants to be so close that you can have a conversation with him anytime. And you can say, Dad, I, you know what? The greatest thrill I get dad is, is to be around you and he says well the greatest thrill I get is when you show up at my house and you act like you enjoy being there and when you come excited about being in my presence all kinds of things start happening if you get distracted by life people by what you do or events then God can't move in our lives so revival has to start at your dining room table and the two people living at that house have got to fall back in love with each other and start building a relationship that your grandkids can talk about. There's a dear family 
in Houston, Texas that just passed away. They were just good saints in a local church. Been married 60-something years. He passed away on Monday and she passed away on Wednesday. And they buried them both together as children of God because they loved one another so much that God honored them by taking them both. They were in their 80s, close to 90 years of age, but he took them both at the same time as a commitment to their love that they showed one another, showed their kids and everybody was around them. You talk to anybody about them, that's what they'd tell you. That should not be an exception. It should be the rule of life. When we love people, then we're going to treat them like he treats us. When husbands treat their wives like he treats his church, incredible things start happening. Your kids start changing. They're not going to look to the world to find relief or, or some other thing. They're going to want to find what you have with God. Research says that 40% of millennials now are leaving the church. And they're not leaving the church because they don't want a relationship with God. They're leaving the church because they don't want a relationship with the church. They want a relationship with God. And churches are not teaching them how to have a relationship with God. And that's what they're hungry for. So if we really want to see a revival of young people today, if we'll start teaching them again about their relationship with God and what that relationship can be like, incredible revival is going to happen. It's going to start. And it should start right here. Louisiana was the, was the place where that revival of the early 1900 Jesus name started and it spread from here throughout all of the United States. Why not at the end of time? It does, why doesn't that fire show up in, in our lives and in some home and all of a sudden we start reconnecting back to relationships we haven't have been? Why can't revival start right here that spreads throughout the world and you start seeing eight times what happened in the book of Acts? Anybody, anybody ready to see an eightfold of the book of Acts? It's going to happen. It is going to happen. Now, whether I enjoy it or participate, that is my choice, and that is your choice. Regardless of what you think or you want, it's going to happen. So I have a suggestion to you tonight. Get your families right. Get involved or get out of the way. Revival is here. The wind is blowing again. And as the wind starts coming across America, we're going to start seeing incredible things happen when we as God's kids start getting things right. So here's what I want you to do. Kids, you need to find your parents and you need to bring your mom and dad to an altar tonight. Children, I want you to go get mom and dad. I want you to go get your parents. Grandkids, go get grandma and grandpa. And I want y'all to come as a family to the, house, to the altar tonight. And here's what we're going to do when we get here. I want you as a family to gather and join hands with each other. Form a circle, not a line. I want no lines in this place. If there's only two of you, stand facing each other and take each other by the hand. And I want you to start praying for your families tonight. I want you to pray a blessing into the life of everybody you're holding by the hand. I want you to pray that they become everything God created them to be. I want you to pray that the blessing of God falls on their lives and that they become this incredible vessel of honor God created them to be. And then once we get this started tonight, I want you to show back up here on a regular basis and do this over and over and over. This is what we used to do as a kid, and we quit doing it. We start our marriage at an altar, but rarely do we bring our family back to recommit ourselves to this altar. So would you please pray for one another tonight? Moms, pray for husbands. Husbands, pray for wives. Pray for kids. Kids, pray for mom and dad. Kids, your, your mom and dad need your prayer. They need you to pray that God would help them become everything they need to be. So let's pray tonight. Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you would make every man in this place tonight to be the vessel of honor you created him to be. Jesus, I pray tonight that you would help him 
to become the vessel of honor that he would become the husband he should be to his wife that he would love his wife as you love the church that he would prove to her over and over and over again that he would lay his life down for her that his home is the safest place she can ever find she'll never be mistreated there she'll never hear words of anger or rage or hatred there you will treat her with dignity and respect that he would help her to become the vessel of honor that you created her to be i pray he'd become the father he should be to his children to lead them in spiritual things i pray he becomes the priest of his home and takes over the priestly robe of his home i pray lord that he not only become the priest of his home i pray lord that he would lead his family and worship on a regular basis not waiting for his wife to lead but he would step into the role of priesthood and that he would lead his family as the priest of his home lord i pray you'd bless our ladies tonight to become the vessel of honor you created them to be vessels of honor not broken not defective i pray she becomes the woman she should be to her world the mother she should be to her children the wife she should be to her husband i pray that she would bring her children up in the nurture and admonition of the lord you created her with incredible abilities to teach and nurture so god i pray tonight that tonight we would start uh, that she would start training and sharing with her children how valuable they are and that her children would become the light of her life that her life would be focused around them and she'd make them feel so special and treat and train and teach them because you gave her that ability i pray lord you'd bless our children to become the vessel of honor you created them to be i pray lord that the world doesn't convince them they're broke they don't know what they are they don't have a clue what their sexuality is god i pray tonight that moms and dads will create the right atmosphere for children to discover that they were created in your image not broke not defective but vessels of honor honored to be used for your kingdom they'd discover their talents their abilities and they'd use their talents and their abilities for your service and for your kingdom lord i pray today that you'd protect their homes that you'd build a hedge around them i cannot see my world i can't see the spirit world around me but you can so god i'm praying tonight that you'd build a hedge around every home because satan knows if he can wreck a home he's wrecked the church and if he can wreck the church he's wrecked the city and if he wrecks the city he's wrecked the state the nation and in the world as a result of just one family becoming chaotic so god i pray today you'd build the hedge to not allow enemies in to sow tares among wheat would you station your angels around every home and not allow some enemy to bring discord or chaos there i pray lord tonight that if walls have been built in relationship if there are issues in a home i pray tonight that someone would make a decision to start taking some walls down and rebuilding a relationship they started a long time ago not letting life or problems or people cause them to want to abandon what they started but make a decision they're going to create the right atmosphere they're going to create the right home and they're going to take ownership of life and in doing so they're going to protect their homes and their family bind our hearts together tonight jesus in the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace touch us with your presence tonight in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name now let it be more than words take whoever you prayed for in your arms and hug them and tell them how valuable they are to you and how much you love them and then make a commitment to them that starting tonight we're going to do this on a regular basis. We're going to come back here on a regular basis and we're going to love one another. We're going to pray for one another and we're going to develop a relationship with God that changes the lives of people and families. If you'll do that, incredible revival will break out in this place because then the atmosphere is cracked for newborns to be born and not get lost, abandoned, or wind up in dysfunction or chaos. But the church family has become healthy. And when the family becomes healthy, then God's Spirit has the ability to move and operate our lives. Once you do that with your family, 
and you've loved your family, then find your God's family and start telling them how valuable they are to you. If someone's irritated you really bad over the last few years, won't you go to them tonight? Don't tell them they've irritated you. Just hug them real big and tell them you love them and that you're glad they're part of your family and part of your life. Now you might have to swallow some pride to do that, but I want you to be willing to do whatever you need to have the right relationship so that revival can happen in our world. We're going to baptize we're going to baptize Tyler Gilmore tonight let's thank God for giving Tyler the Holy Ghost Wednesday night amen beautiful night. Tyler, upon the confession of your faith, God has filled you with the Holy Ghost. I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. <laughs> Hallelujah! Yes, Lord! Yes, Lord! <laughs> 